Well, it's been an extraordinary year, hasn't it? And of course, set against some of the world's worst circumstances that we've ever faced. The acute challenges of the global COVID-19 pandemic have demanded fast responses from the world's most innovative industries. And you'll only be too familiar with the challenges we face and the steps we have all taken to help us recover from the economic fallout of this crisis. But I'm very pleased to say that in face of these continuing challenges, London has managed to remain at the forefront for technological innovation and for new innovations from peer-to-peer -peer lending to challenger banks, cyber, insurtech, regtech, paytech, AI, tech for good and blockchains. We now have so many techs, it's hard to, it's hard to remember them all. Um, the UK's track record in pioneering new technologies is testament to its thriving ecosystem and international talent pool. And of course, this isn't just London-based, it spans up and down the entire country. From Edinburgh to Manchester, Newcastle, Bristol and Bath, it's so pleasing that cities outside of London are now thriving innovation hubs. And that's often due to the growing trend of large financial services firms acting as anchors in different cities across the country. Um, and there's no stopping the acceleration of this. And very interesting, Bristol and Bath now boast the highest density of fintech startups of any region outside London. And this isn't just anecdotal. With more than 1,600 fintech firms already located in the UK, it's likely that this will more than double by 2030. And the UK now is accounting for over 11% of the global fintech industry. Our financial services have truly become the harbingers of, of consumer choice. So net-net, I would say that the UK has, has fared very well in this very difficult year, but full of absolutely huge potential for the future. Well, in Singapore, our financial sector has been remarkably resilient and uh, thankfully agile in the face of COVID-19 and its threats. Uh, this reflects the strength of our international financial center built up over many decades, as well as the, the people that we've been able to attract that are at the heart of this service. And 85% of the workers in the financial industry were able to work from home and, and continue to be productive, both as a result of our telco infrastructure, but also as a result of the kind of operating and business model that their employers had been able to set up here in Singapore. And part of that was the ability to adapt very quickly to this challenging uh, environment. As a result, they've performed quite creditably. And in the first three quarters of this year, the growth in the finance and insurance sector averaged at about 4.7%. 4 and we expect that over the year, this sector will be a net creator of jobs. But this is likely to be at a rate lower than in previous years. Uh, some of this growth has been supported by credit intermediation, particularly in offshore bank lending, as regional economies and trade have showed some pickup, as well as a domestic demand for these uh, insurance products. But overall, the financial sector remains in a good position against COVID-19 in that it's functioned with minimal disruptions, continued to grow. And this is despite our uh, circuit breaker, call it a circuit breaker, I think in the rest of the world you refer to as a lockdown, a circuit breaker measures and the uncertain economic outlook that's out there. But it has affected us. I mean, we remain open for business. There are global travel restrictions. We have local safe management measures for COVID-19, but undeniably we have been affected. And part of that is because we start from a high base of global connectivity and, and standing as a regional headquarters for, for many global entities. So COVID-19 has required that even in this sector, even though they're growing, even though they're creating jobs, even though they're doing well, for this sector to think of new ways of working around uh, the various challenges, increasing digital transformation, uh, an increasing shift about how their model uh, operates. And one of the uncertainties is whether in our region does, may, will decentralize their regional hub operations, shift to regional roles in market to reduce a concentration risk, or where businesses and financial institutions further consolidate their regional or even global functions into a safe and resilient harbor here in Singapore, entrenching their key activities in a single location to facilitate continued operations and decision-making in a protracted uh, pandemic. These are not two mutually exclusive scenarios. And actually we need to, 
enhance our positioning so that we can support entities that are choosing either of these options or indeed that pivot between these two options depending on their business strategies and, and risk appetites. And this is something that we will focus on, enhancing our connectivity, deepening the human capital that is available here in Singapore, the development and deployment of tech technology, and, and ultimately make ourselves continue to be that trusted center for partners, talent, technology, and capital, human and otherwise. One example, uh, even in the midst of what's been happening, we've announced a new tech pass, an extension of our tech at SG program to allow and encourage founders and leaders of technical, with technical expertise to establish themselves here in Singapore. It's been an incredibly difficult year for growing businesses right across the Australian economy. But despite these challenges, our financial services sector has remained strong and our fintech ecosystem has continued to grow. In fact, throughout the COVID crisis, a great strength of the Australian economy has been the resilience of our financial system. Uh, our banks are very well capitalised and we're in good condition as they faced the rapid deterioration uh, in economic conditions. We've worked with our banks to offer uh, restructuring of loans and deferred mortgage payments. And the insurance and superannuation sectors have also proven themselves willing and able to support customers in their time of need. And these actions have really cushioned the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the Australian economy. And it's a testament to the agility of our fintech businesses that they've been able to adapt and to persevere through this economic shock. Uh, the Australian government sees really exciting opportunities in fintech, opportunities that will set up our economy uh, for a strong and secure recovery. The latest data, in fact, demonstrates that the Australian fintech ecosystem continues to grow. And to me, this comes as no surprise. Having had the privilege of spending half a year now, uh, a year and a half now as the fintech sector's minister and advocate, advocate for it on the uh, international stage, I've been struck by the exceptionally high regard in which Australian fintech is held globally for its ingenuity and also for its diversity. I'm really proud that it's an ecosystem that's backed by arguably the strongest infrastructure in the world. So APRA and ASIC's regulatory frameworks, uh, a new payments platform, a new fintech regulatory sandbox, and a strong tax incentive system to encourage innovation. And right now, of course, the world's first economy-wide consumer data right. It's been really encouraging to see so many Australian fintechs leveraging all this infrastructure and producing some terrific results this year. Global capital has continued to flow into the sector. Uh, this year, Afterpay closed uh, an $800 million funding round. Uh, Airwallex raised uh, $220 million in a Series D and Zingerbank has secured around $433 million in investment. And that's just a few highlights. So the message here is clear. Australian FinTech is very much open for business. Um, the pandemic has acted as a significant break on globalisation in many sectors, although technology and communication services have been notable exceptions. And the logistics of managing cross-border supply chains have become more complex because of efforts to contain the virus that now, of course, include sporadic implementation of localised lockdowns. The outlook for recovery and growth after COVID-19 is still highly uncertain. But as we emerge from the COVID-19 crisis, as we surely will do at some point, one issue that has been brought into focus is the impact of business on the society and environment in which it operates. London is Europe's undisputed financial capital, while our central geographic location between global time zones allows UK firms to engage with Asia in the morning and the United States in the afternoon. English is the preeminent language of international business. English law is used to underpin a majority of global contracts and the UK's competitive tax regime helps set us apart. We have one of the world's most highly skilled and well-educated workforces and a liberalised, business-friendly environment. 
And we're working to build a new UK, a UK that is truly international in its focus, a global Britain with a world-class economy fit for the future. This, um, this issue of technologically driven transformation, it is a public good for us within Singapore, as it is for many cities, states, and jurisdictions. But it will be a public good if we can get the model right across borders uh, on the basis of international cooperation. And there are, there are some divides uh, that we need to think about both internally as well as externally. I've hinted at a couple of them already in our previous discussion around security, privacy, and inclusion. But I would, if you can frame it as divides, there are essentially three broad divides that we would like to think through and we need to think through. The digital divide, which is access to and the ability to use these tools. A social divide, because the internet fundamentally is a fragmentary process where echo chambers are developed in many, many different platforms. And this is not something new for the most recent social media giants, but something that's been there since the days of bulletin board and, and news nets. That as these technologies become more pervasive, there's an increasing human behavior that leads to these echo chambers and polarizations where we like to hear our own opinions reinforced. And that means that our own prejudices perhaps get stronger. And the third divide is a political divide. The, the, the full impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the international uh, scene in terms of supply chains and relationships, economic and financial ramifications, still haven't played out. We're going to see more and more of the implications over the next year or two, especially, whether it's raw materials, finished products, but also security standards, uh, interoperability standards. And so if we don't push back against these trends, we will be divided further rather than being unified further. Split in standards in emerging technology, whether it's 5G, IoT, or internet protocols, would all become a problem for the kind of globalized ideal that we all enjoyed the benefits of until fairly recently pre-COVID-19. Now, in a way, that period of time was quite unusual because in the past, most of our existence has been slightly fragmented on, on, the, on an international scene. I mean, uh, telecommunication standards in the 1980s is one example, but there are many other examples where there was a North American standard, a European standard, a Japanese standard, uh, 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 Russian, Chinese, and, and different parts of the world had difficulty interoperating with one another. And from about the early, uh, late 1990s until fairly recently, Actually, what we saw was an increasing flattening of the world and increasing operability, even if there were a variety of standards. There was a general sense of collective responsibility and trust between stakeholders and an understanding that governments as regulators have a critical role to establish these standards, maintain oversight, provide directions in order to foster a rules-based and norms-based multilateral system across their borders. And I think the value of that has been demonstrated in, in lived experience for most of the world until very recently as a result of all the various restrictions and problems coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic, but also because of the shifts in the geopolitical space in terms of international relations. The benefits are there in our memory and we have to find a way to regain those benefits on behalf of all our people. We have a unique set of tailwinds in Australia. You know, our fintech product offerings are very diverse and we have tremendous organic growth. Australian fintech has very quickly become a mature industry with a strong culture of collaboration by both challengers and incumbents. In fact, according to the Fintech Australia Census, over three quarters of Australian fintechs now are post revenue and one quarter of those companies have year on year growth of over 300%. So building on our strong financial services foundations, we're establishing a reputation here for quality. In fact, last year, uh, Australian, seven Australian companies were, were named a, among the world's top 100 fintechs. And it really helps that Australians are very keen adopters of financial technology. We've created a strong, you know, really solid customer base for an industry that can hold its own and it continues to grow. But critically, it's also a globally focused ecosystem. This year, over half of Australian fintech firms are focused on expanding overseas and over 40% already have that international presence. And you'll recognise the names of our rising stars, names like Airwallex and Afterpay, 
and Judo and uh, Athena Home Loans. They're just some of the, the companies that are featured in this year's FinTech 100. There are so many more uh, that are already working with the world's foremost banks and governments too. So as far as headwinds are concerned though, of course the economic consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic has put pressure on many, many businesses and including those in the FinTech sector. Some have found it more difficult to access capital uh, limits on global movements and of course and physical presence also pose barriers for firms that are seeking investment and looking to enter new markets or applying for regulatory approval overseas. In addition, in Australia's financial services sector, incumbent firms still have immense advantages and among them is the data that they hold on their customers and the power of inertia that tendency uh, of customers to stay with their current provider even when uh, they know or they suspect that a better deal exists elsewhere. So to give you some background, our banking sector is very strong, but when it comes to competition, we have a lot more work to do. Well, overseas investment is, is very important to the UK and we are one of the most highly overseas invested countries in the world. Um, we absolutely welcome that. Um, we're open to investment and we, and we know that overseas invested firms are productive, they're innovative and they increase productivity in the UK. So we always do all we can to encourage um, overseas investment. But of course it's been a, a difficult year worldwide for overseas investment. Um, the UNCTAD statistics show that overseas investment dropped by 49% in the first half of this year. So we have, we're going all out to try to increase the amount of overseas investment coming into, coming into the UK. And as part of this, I was very pleased where our Prime Minister has just, has just announced that we're creating a new office for investment right at the heart of government. And this crack team of investment specialists will be tasked with providing a single front door for high potential investors, identifying and help us, uh, helping us secure the kind of game-changing international investment that's already done so much for this country and which has the potential to do so much more. And charging up our first gigafactory perhaps, or giving a shot in the arm to our already thriving life science sector, there's huge potentials. And of course, FinTech is going to be a big topic for, for this office. Um, it's, a, it's a good rule in life to, to, play, to our, play to our strengths, and there will, we have no greater strength than, 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 than FinTech. And what this office will do, um, it will bring together business expertise from beyond Whitehall and beyond. Um, it will break down those bureaucratic barriers which sometimes get in the way of existing and potential investors. And we really will try to make sure that it makes a, a real substantial difference to, to investors. Um, established in Downing Street, um, it will be rooted into the Department for International Trade and very much a completely integral part of our overall investment offering and our, and our global, global network. So this is a great demonstration that we are open to the world, that we want to do business with companies around the world, um, and we absolutely want to encourage as many fintechs to come here as possible, and then we, we, we will find the investment and we will, we will help them build. Including as many people in Singapore, in the opportunities of a digital world are made far more clear for this post-COVID world. And so our anxiety about closing it has increased, but I don't believe the divide itself has widened. One of the reasons I say this is that our approach is not to say that everybody must be able to do the same thing and, and not everybody need not be able to uh, or want to log on and complete their entire transaction through a, a digital document. In fact, if as much as possible, we hope to be able to bring the service to the platform and the process that someone is comfortable with. And so if you know an 80 year old grandmother is comfortable with WhatsApp, but is not comfortable with other types of online engagements, we've got to find a way to make our services then interoperable with her platform. And ultimately, if the only way they're prepared to interact with government or to have that transaction is through a human being, that's not a bad thing if that person on the other side of the counter has access to all the digital services 
that our economy and our society have to offer, then the the, the human interaction is a process to bridge the digital divide as well. And so the, those are two aspects of our philosophy, which we think we can roll out well and which will increasingly help us to close the digital divide in Singapore. So we launched open banking in Australia through the consumer data right in July this year. In these very early stages of the platform, our consumer data right is really about helping Australians engage with the financial services that they use and demonstrating the potential of the most basic use cases like product switching. I do think, however, that we will see a rise in intermediary services being offered. Our accreditation body is in the process right now of finalising the rules that apply to intermediaries. You know, ultimately, open banking is, is like a network of pipes. You know, if you're building a house, chances are you'd employ a plumber to deal with the piping rather than try and do it yourself. Well, the same goes for fintech firms looking at how they build their CDR compliance. I think we can expect a sort of significant growth in companies that are offering open banking as a service as scaling fintechs realise that using such services can allow them to focus more on developing their core business model. But our accreditation body is currently assessing applications from a, a really wide range of companies, from accounting products to credit assessment tools and much, much more. And I really look forward to the CDR spurring on even further fintech innovation in applications uh, that we as a government at the moment could scarcely imagine. You know, the CDR presents a really exciting platform through which uh, to further digital trade too. And this pertains not just to banking, but right across the economy. You know, including uh, more general cross-border data sharing and consent standards. We have an incredible opportunity here with the UK in particular, with the CDR coinciding with the negotiation of the Australia-UK Free Trade Agreement. So this presents a real turning point, an opportunity to create an exemplar in global standard setting when it comes to consumer data. It's a chance for Australia to influence the digital, the direction of digital trade globally and to nudge the rest of the world towards adopting the important protections that Australian consumers have come to expect, such as uh, robust standards for privacy, uh, cyber security, uh, consumer consent, um, mutual data sharing obligations and prudential oversight. There's an increasing desire for commonality of data standards as an enabler of cross-border trade and as the first jurisdiction internationally to implement an economy-wide uh, economy standards, much of the world is now looking to Australia as that exemplar. Well, alongside the economy-wide negotiations and trade agreements, the UK has a number of bilateral partnerships focus specifically on fintech. Fintech bridges are our flagship international fintech policy. We signed our first bridge with Singapore in 2016. And our most extensive one is with Australia, which we signed in 2018. So it's a great pleasure to be speaking alongside senior representatives from both countries today. And these fintech bridges, they're bespoke bilateral agreements between governments, regulators and ecosystems in the UK and, and a priority market. And we've established five fintech bridges so far with Singapore, South Korea, China, Hong Kong and Australia. And these agreements create valuable opportunities for expansion and collaboration by overcoming barriers to market entry, encouraging knowledge sharing and aligning international policy development. And I'm pleased that we've also recently agreed a financial innovation partnership between the UK and the US. And this is a collaboration between HM Treasury, my department DIT, the US Department of Treasury, US Department of Commerce, and it's set up to deepen bilateral engagement on emerging trends in financial services innovation. And I think this will be very important to the, to the fintech industry. We continue to forge new partnerships. Um, we're working towards shared international standards in order to open up trade and investment and investment opportunities and reduce, of course, unnecessary barriers to international investment and commerce. Um, strengthening these partnerships is quite clear to me. It requires effective and structured engagement at a government and regulatory level, both 
bilaterally and multilaterally, as well as involvement, of course, of the private sector. And if we get this right, it will drive practical outcomes and commercial value, and I hope benefit, benefit all of us. There isn't going to be a single answer to that. We, we, we started on this journey for enhancing our financial center five years ago with strong partnership from industry and a multi-pronged strategy, a balanced regulatory landscape, balancing space for innovation, but also needing to manage risk. Understanding, I mean, we get it. We understand that getting that correct balance between regulatory space for innovation and regulatory control for risk gives businesses and other entities the certainty that for, for them to do, make long-term plans and creates the space for new products and services. We've focused on a world-class digital infrastructure for the adoption and proliferation of new technologies. We get it because technology is, is not a technology for its own sake, but a key enabler for many of these businesses uh, to proliferate here in this region. And we understand that you need that network effect that ideas and people and talent need to sort of co-mingle and pool so that they can bounce off each other, generate new partnerships, come up with new research ideas and develop new capabilities. And so we think we're on the right path. It's never ending. We keep having to adjust and fix, but we think we're not doing too badly. 50 years ago, sorry, I beg your pardon. Let me say that again. Five years ago, we had 50 fintech firms and now we have more than a thousand wide range of spaces that they are operating in solutions for payments, wealth management, banking, um, insurance, capital markets, AI, blockchain, name it. Um, we've got 40 innovation labs, uh, 500 innovation projects coming out of them. And fintech firms attracted a billion sing dollars of investment last year in 2019. This year, despite the COVID-19 pandemic, it looks like it's going to be another record year for fintech investments here in Singapore. And the, the part of this demonstration of success has been the adoption and the deployment of digital finance and business solutions enabling continuity during the COVID-19 period. We, we've had products such as MyInfo, which is a government uh, identity verification process, then adopted by the private sector uh, to, to, to deal with some of these issues around trust and security. We have our digital payment solution, PayNow, again, enabling a, a whole series of new business models to be built on top of that. And uh, API exchange, allowing down at the level of microservices and APIs, fintechs and financial institutions to connect with each other, as well as with the regulator, again, driving new operating models and business models. There's, there's a lot more to be done. I mean, I'm not trying to say that we've got everything done and dusted. Uh, the, the, point I want to make is that we are on the right track, but we understand the urgency, purpose, and the need for doing this right in order to deal with the impact post-COVID. And so this pace of digital transformation will only accelerate, and we have to embrace that idea that will only accelerate and be part of that process. And we hope that we will have partners uh, to help us both locally and internationally, governments, as well as um, private sector entities to be part of this process of driving um, success here in Singapore. Thank you. The Australia-UK FinTech Bridge has been operating for just over two years now, and it's a clear signal of the strength of our two countries' FinTech relationship. The bridge is helping Australian FinTechs enter the UK market, and it's helping us in Australia benefit from the capital and the skills and the products that UK firms are bringing here. The bridge, of course, is a great start and there's significant potential to build on it further. And that's why the Australian government has recently invested an additional $10 million to widen the bridge, provide more staffing and resources for participants on either side, and also to increase our already very strong regulatory engagement. Critically, this funding will also assist in extending the bridge program to other key partner nations in our region, the fastest growing internet market in the world. And this, there's tremendous opportunity here right on our doorstep. And when I spoke at the first Singapore FinTech Festival this time last year, in all my conversations with global counterparts, I was really impressed at just how highly regarded Australia is as a FinTech destination. And a large part of this attractiveness, of course, is our demographic advantage, which makes us an ideal test bed for companies looking to bridge the gap between Western markets and the Asia Pacific region. 
Australia, uh, Australians are very digitally and financially literate and we have excellent financial inclusion with a banked population of nearly 100%. And while we have very similar demographics to much of Western Europe and to North America, we also have a strong geographical and cultural and economic ties with the key Asia Pacific trading nations and especially Singapore. These are inherent and enduring advantages that will be just as strong when we come out of the COVID crisis. And for all of us in the Australian government, we want to ensure that the best infrastructure is in place to build on these strengths. Well, you know, the impact from the pandemic has been severe, but it's an opportunity to reinvent the way we do things. Uh, many of the pressures uh, and imperatives coming out of the pandemic have been there for some time. So the adoption of digital technology, the impetus to adopt digital solutions to overcome uh, business model restrictions, public health restrictions, a lot of that has been happening for some years now here in Singapore. The pandemic has given further impetus made the, the reasons for it extremely clear in terms of uh, both opportunities and risk. But a good example is basically this interview, you know, this having this uh, FinTech Festival and uh, our Singapore Week of Innovation and Technology in this hybrid format. We would not have been expected a year ago. And frankly speaking, we would not have had the skill sets to be able to deliver it in quite the same way. And we've had to up our game just as the rest of the world has had to as well. But we've also seen a reshaping of mindsets, attitudes towards digital solutions, digital services, um, and the adoption there of the normalization of these tools. The pandemic and the business responses, the regulatory responses have lowered the barriers, but also changed user expectations, trying out these digital services for the first time. And now it's become extremely uh, expected that we would make these opportunities uh, available. So that mindset shift is important. Uh, but when you talk about risks and opportunities, uh, that space that has been created has created for the government uh, some opportunity to increase the push that, to make it possible for micro, small and medium ent enterprises, which employ, I think, 70 percent of our workforce to get on board this digital bandwagon. And this is, again, something that we've had some difficulty and some resistance in the past, but the need for that and the opportunity for that now has become much more clear. So this has been something we've been thinking about for some time, but now the targeted financial assistance to affected sectors, um, targeted to get them on board, but also broad-based efforts to try to get SMEs in general on board our digital program have been received in a very different light. Adoption numbers have doubled in the last six months and several schemes from uh, SMEs that are just getting going to productivity solutions for SMEs that are in the middle of their journey and something we call Grow Digital for SMEs that are really already au fait with this but are looking to expand their business overseas. These are the kinds of opportunities that in a way the pandemic has created or accelerated. There's also an opportunity for inclusion. And uh, we've in Singapore launched something we call the SG Digital Office. Uh, and really the idea behind that is to reach out to seniors, people who either have less of an interest or less of a skill set to get on board this uh, digital transformation that we're seeing across the rest of our nation and have these ambassadors reach out either to provide training, to uh, sort of be a, a, a brand advocate in terms of the ease with which they can get on board, but also to handhold people, seniors especially, to demonstrate the value of the kind of services that they have uh, made available through this digital space. But there are some risks and some, some challenges. Uh, the challenges, I would say, there are three key sets of challenges and risks, security, privacy, and inclusion. And the security argument is well understood as more services, more platforms, more products, and more transactions are now happening online. The, the surface area for that risk, the threat space, has significantly increased. And so uh, our professionals working in cybersecurity, companies that are providing cybersecurity solutions, they have a significantly greater workload to contend with, but also a significantly greater business opportunity. So security as a key risk and a key challenge, given the amount of dig digitalization that's happening. But at the same time, privacy, as many more transactions go online, the opportunity for what seems to be fairly innocuous transactions to generate 
data sets which are of interest either to people who want to monetize this in a way that wasn't intended or for truly malicious means. The privacy risk is there and it's something that we need to drive uh, solutions towards and, and protect in a way that preserves space for innovation and businesses to provide interesting and great products. And thirdly, inclusion. I mentioned a little bit about this before, as these products and these opportunities become a real value add, creating jobs, creating opportunity, we have to make sure that they're available to everybody. And that requires an extra set of steps, which are not always digital steps, that we have to think through our process policy and human steps to bring people into this space. Well, let me put this very simply. FinTech is the future of our financial services. And we continue to work closely with financial institutions, both domestically and in international markets, to support the adoption of technology and innovation and to help them position for the future. So, how are we doing this? Well, we've launched a strategic review of the UK FinTech sector and by bringing together perspectives from leaders across the industry, this review will identify priority areas for industry and policymakers to support the ongoing success of the UK fintech sector. And it will help us further hone our approach to fintech in the UK and beyond. We're expecting its recommendations in the first quarter of 2021, and they will address three critical objectives, enabling growth, widespread adoption of fintech solutions and, of course, we hope advancing the UK's international reputation. Secondly, to encourage and facilitate the adoption of UK fintech solutions around the globe, we're launching our Leading Edge Global Partnerships programme. And through this, we are building stronger partnerships with international financial institutions in priority markets such as Singapore, Australia and the USA to help them access the very best possible British fintech solutions. And, and we're delighted that the three major Singaporean banks have already agreed to partner with us in this initiative. And there are many other noteworthy initiatives underway, but the final one I'll touch on quickly is our Payments Landscape Review, um, which we've announced because of the very rapid technology developments in this space. Now, the United Kingdom was a, a global leader in faster payments when, it, when we launched this in 2008. And this review will enable us to re-evaluate the aims for payment networks in the UK, their effectiveness, and where there are opportunities, gaps and risks that need to be addressed in order to ensure that the UK maintains its status as a country at the cutting edge of payments technology. And I, I'm sure that we will be able to do this. In short, we continue to ask what can be done better to engage with the private sector and to seek new solutions to ensure that we have the right infrastructure and systems to support an innovative, resilient and globally leading sector now and in the future. Well, we understand the importance of supporting our fintech ecosystem at all stages, from pre-revenue to post-revenue to exporters, and to do whatever we can as a government to help get capital markets moving, boost uh, fintech adoption and also help our companies grow. We remain focused on building our international fintech partnerships, including the UK, the UK Fintech Bridge, uh, expanding the CDR, and growing our instant payments platform and much, much more. This year's budget included uh, an $800 million investment in fintech related capability. The, in addition to additional funding for the CDR and for the fintech bridge, we're also in investing in developing a digital ID system, uh, also in modernising business registers, uh, expanding e-invoicing and boosting our regtech infrastructure as well. We've also invested an additional $2 billion in our research and development tax incentive, helping early stage businesses claim back up to 62 cents in the dollar in tax refunds for R&D expenditure. And I also want to highlight that Australia is fortunate to have a really strong regtech ecosystem. I've often said that you can't have a high growth fintech sector without the regtech tools to match. 
The proliferation of outstanding regtech services focused on Australia's regulatory system helps to ensure that we remain a competitive place to do business and also that the market entrants can easily navigate around our regulatory system. Equally, we're equipping our regulators with the technology that they need to do their job with the agility that a modern market marketplace demands. We're working very hard to promote investment and also adoption of RegTech because it makes our financial system more efficient and it builds greater trust in our institution and also in our regulators. As a whole, the Australian government has tremendous confidence in our fintech capability. It's a particular passion of our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, who in fact was the person that commenced the work on the CDR and also on the FinTech Bridge when he was the Treasurer. So as a government and as the Minister responsible for the sector, our door is always open to opportunities to collaborate and to grow. And I'm very excited about the progress that 2021 will bring.